Hello everyone, uh, it's great to be presenting in the Third Basin Sanity Forum. I'm Chen Mingjiang from the University of Queensland. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the recharge and drying in the environmental watering site of the Lower River Murray. Before my start, I would like to thank Murray Darling Basin Authority and Department of Environmental and Water in South Australia to support the project. And we also got um, tremendous help from Murray Land and River Land Landscape Board and Hydra Consulting. Um, for this project. So literally this project is being uh, referred to as Jelly Bean Project and I'll show you the reason why it's been called that name. Uh, I'll uh, quickly introduce about the outline of the project. So I'll introduce about uh, why this needs to be done and I'll talk about why, um, how the site is being selected and the deployment of the monitoring system. I'll show the field result laboratory result and numerical modeling result and finally conclusion will be made. So environmental watering is a key strategy uh, to manage water in Murray floodplain. Um, it's uh, essentially done by pumping uh, water uh, to the basins or uh, river reaches to re nourish the vegetation. As you could imagine, once the water is being pumped into these areas, it will be potentially uh, evapotranspirated. It could also be infiltrated down to the soil and later on recharged to the saline groundwater. Uh, so a clear mass balance is out there. But the question here is how much are each of the components? These are the key questions we would like to answer from our um, project. Next slide. Um, so we need to find out an ideal site to conduct this test and the site has to be ideally circular, initially dry and situated in a private property to secure the instrument and it's partially covered by vegetation. So this site at Myrtle Villa comes into attention and if you see from the surface it's really like a jelly bean and that's how the name is being made. So next slide here shows um, the um, the look of the jelly bean basin plus the instrumentation. So first of all, uh, all the yellow tags shows the creek connected to the Murray River, the orchard in the highland on both ends of the basin. And the basin is potentially uh, 200 meters in diameter. Uh, water is being pumped from the creek to the basin using a flat um, hose. Um, so in terms of instrument, we basically deployed four sets of instruments called SA1, SA2, and SA3. So SA2 is right in the middle of the basin. It is equipped with um, a piezometer inside the borehole to see the rise of the water table as a result of recharge. It also monitors the surface water depth. And remember that we have the uh, digital elevation model uh, obtained by radar, and we are able to convert that um, uh, uh, evapotranspiration and recharge by the area um, so that we can work out the volumetric amount of water taken away by evapotranspiration and recharge. We also deploy the moisture sensors to monitor the um, moisture profile in depth within the soil. SA3 has also similar setup as compared to the SA2 but it's just at the boundary of the basin. The SA1 and SA4 are equipped with moisture sensor arrays plus two balls and that is able to see how the water table gets dissipated uh, right um, outside of the uh, jelly bean basin. So in terms of water balances, we have the pond storage plus the saturated, unsaturated zone storage which are separately monitored by the pressure transducers and moisture sensors is equal to the pump inflow, which are monitored by the water meter, plus rainfall, which is from weather station, minus evapotranspiration using weather station, minus recharge. So basically, the approach is laid out all there, and we will see how, what will happen. So once we deploy the pressure uh, the, the um, balls, what we find is that um, the soil is um, uh, stratified by three layers, sealed layers on the top, clay layer that se separates the sealed and sandy aquifer, and the si sandy aquifer that is uh, lying down. And once we install those bowls, we can see the water table actually bounced up uh, uh, from 7 meters below the surface to about uh, 4 meters below the surface. So it's clearly a, a confined aquifer. 
Next slide here shows the soil extracted during the bore construction. So from the from the core trace left side is the surface, right hand side is uh, um, the further deep in the soil. So the top two cores are pretty much like crumble soil induced by desiccation. As it goes further deep, the color becomes more darkened and um, and also um, we've got uh, clay. Um, and, and once we have reached the sandy layer, we can see we are not able to maintain its shape uh, due to the fine, the, the coarse soil material. These pictures here shows um, uh, the overall uh, look of the um, basin before the system deployment. So what we can see it's covered by the vegetation and on the soil surface there are cavities underneath once we try to shovel the cavities, we can see that um, they are interconnected by the tunnels. You might be interested in why those um, cavities is being formed. We are as well. So we actually bring all the uh, seals back into the laboratory and are allowed to dry under wind condition. As you can see that during the drying process, the volume shrinks and the crack forms, which causes the formation of the channel. And if the wind brings more dust and cover on top, that will cover part of these uh, uh, cracks and forms the cavities right on the surface. Next slide here. So here is the overall view of the instrumented instrument deployed in the, into the field. And as you can see, they are powered by solar and connected to the internet. And um, we are able to receive the data in real time and online. This is a very important um, um, features in the monitoring because particularly during the uh, COVID um, where the border closure is happening um, now and then. The next slide here shows um, the moisture sensor deploy um, so that you can tell how uh, the wetting front moves down or the drying front moves upward. Next slide here shows uh, the pumping setup. So the pump has the capacity of delivering 1.5 megaliters per day, which is equivalent of one standard swimming pool, 50 meter long, and they use a flattened uh, hose to connect all the way to the basin. And um, the loud that is facing up with geofabric to prevent local erosions. So this is the uh, video that shows uh, the initial um, stage of the e-watering. As the water is pumped into the wetland, it preferentially uh, transports through these underlying tunnels. And as the tunnels uh, enlarges, the surface gets um, uh, collapsed, uh, making them as the open channels. So if you look at the overall stage, um, these channels um, looks like a water serpent um, at the outside of the e water. Next slide, please. So here is the verification of DEM. As we discussed before, we have um, got the LiDAR and scanning to see the DEM, but we need to confirm whether those DEM are accurate. So uh, we use two other ways to uh, obtain the um, DEM as well. One is to see uh, from the LiDAR the aerial images using drone. The second is that we walk around the basin regularly um, using a GPS that also tracks the water edges. As, as you can see that uh, the green hatched er area um, has the similar boundary as compared to uh, the result obtained from drone images and um, walking tracks, which confirms that uh, the DEM is pretty accurate. And we also compare the surface area obtained by the tree method at different times, and they matches very well. So in that case, we are confident that the surface area could be well captured, and then we can convert any rates into the volumetric rate. This slide here shows uh, the overall uh, result obtained from the field. So the monitoring is lasted for 10 months, uh, starting from March of this year. So the top right pictures is the images taken on the site uh, twice per day. So if you see the whole process, um, you can see initially it's dry. Now the pond is formed, but the water level is decreasing. And later on, it's completely depleted, and then the surface gets exposed again. 
So the picture on the lower bottom shows the inundation area. So this is um, uh, estimated using the DEM. So we are monitoring the height of the, the water depth of the pond. We can convert that into the inundation area using the calibrated DEM. So now let's look at figure D. The figure D here is the evapotranspiration transpiration obtained by the weather station. So what does this tell is that during summer, which is in April and November, the evapotranspiration is relatively high, whereas in the winter, the rate goes down to 5 millimeters per day. Um, we can combine this with the inundation area to work out the evapotranspiration coming out from the basin. Uh, the cumulative rainfall over the 10 months is roughly 100 millimeters, as shown in figure E. Um, so now jump to figure H. Figure H is the surface water depth measured by the pressure transducer. So you can see there are two increases, one at the beginning of the monitoring period. The second one is occurring as a small rise in May. So those are the first e-watering and the second top-up. Other than these two processes, the water level just moving down um, monotonically, which is induced by the combined effect of recharge and evapotranspiration. Now let's move on figure I. This is a very important figure here. Um, so the figure I shows the, the rise of groundwater table as compared to the initial condition. So what we learned from this is that um, the green, if we look at the green line, green line is the rise of the water table at SA3. SA3 is at the boundary of the basin. So the rise of the water table is taking place almost instantaneous after the start of the e -watering. And the rise of the water table there is about 2 meters. And that 2 meters is maintained for a couple of months until September when the water level starts of dropping down. And the dropping down is induced by the disappearance of the pond. As you can see, when the vertical line moves in September, um, the surface uh, pond is almost disappeared, which causes the flattening of the bulged water table. If we now look at the yellow line, um, which is the rise of the water table right in the middle of the pond, so it also observed a slightly increase, but the height is only about one meter. And this is very likely because uh, that um, uh, this area, the recharge is relatively less intense as compared to SA3, given that SA3 is surrounded by shrubs where the roots could um, make a preferential pathway. If we look at the other two lines, which are blue and red, you can see there is a slightly rise of the water table but the intensity is not as strong as the two balls that is within the pond. And these two balls are installed inside, uh, outside of the basin. So a small increase, but this, that really means that um, if, even though groundwater table surrounded by the basin is rising, but the intensity is very, very small. The following graph, J, shows the fluctuation of the EC. As the fresh water is fresh, the surface water is fresh, and the saline groundwater is very saline, so the EC fluctuates depending on the mixing of the two waters. There's another interesting tracer we used, which is in figure K. Uh, the, figure, the figure K shows the uh, groundwater temperature rise. So it, usually groundwater temperature is relatively constant, once they receive uh, colder fresh water through recharge, the temperature will drop down. So what we learn from this is that um, three out of the boreholes has received a drop down of the temperature, which is a clearly indication of the recharge. So next slide, please. So this picture here shows the moisture profiles within the top soil, which is about um, 0.5 meters. So the figure A and B uh, shows responsively uh, ET and rainfall as the reference. SA outside of the pond, um, which is um, the, um, the, the control where it's never been inundated. So what we can see that is that moisture content remains very low, but once the rainfall season comes up, the top moisture sensor sinks the rise of the moisture content, but it goes back to the normal condition, dry condition, almost straight away. So that actually means that if there's no e-watering, 
there will be no way to have any recharge from this flank line. So the S2 and SA3 are the two sides uh, right in the middle of the pond. We can see clearly there is a spike of the moisture content as a result of um, the watering event. As the, um, the pond gets dry, we can see that um, the uh, moisture content over the depth start of decreasing. Interestingly, you see that um, the sensor it shows the drying is not um, down in a one by one. Instead, it's dropping down in a group manner, which means that um, the drying is taking place um, almost um, instantaneously over depth. The other key message shows here is that um, even after the pond has been disappeared for two months, there's still plenty of soil moisture uh, within the um, in the seal layer, which are readily to supply water for the vegetations. Here is a very interesting graph for uh, anyone who does uh, inundation recharge. Uh, here is the recharge rate as a function of pound depth, um, pound water depth. Um, so what we learned from here is, um, so first of all, the red lines are the first recharge, and the, the green dots are the, uh, the, the top up, the second top up, uh, which has the kind of overlap between 0.3 and 0.6. So at the beginning of the e-watering, what we can see is that um, somehow uh, the recharge rate uh, is increasing non-linearly as the uh, pounding water depth increases. However, um, during the second top-up, we can see that um, there is no significant rise of the recharge as compared to the very first e-watering. This is very likely induced by the swelling of the uh, silt and clay when it's being soaked, which uh, blocks all the preferential pathways that goes down to underground. Now, this is the takeaway message about the uh, water balance. Uh, so first, let's look at the blue line. So the blue line is the amount of water pumped into the field. So we can see there are two spikes induced by two e-waterings, and in total, 60 megaliters of water is being pumped into the basin, and that takes about 93.8% of the water um, injected into the basin. Rainfall is about 4 megaliters as shown in the table, which take which is about 6.3% of the overall water uh, in the basin. And for all the outs, let's look at the orange, orange lines. So the orange line is the storage in the pond. And you can see that at the beginning of the e-watering, the pond is almost occupying storing half of the water uh, within the e-watering uh, and later on it drops down. We also see a spike at the top up but then it drops down monotonically and at the end of um, the November as we um, as of today the pond is dry which stores zero percent and ET is about um, 22 megaliters which takes about 34 percent of the overall water and um, during the e-watering the infiltration is about 42 megaliters, which is 65% of the overall water. And just be aware that um, infiltration has two components. One component is the soil moisture stay in the unsaturated zone. The second is recharge. Through the monitoring, we are insufficient to tell how much are uh, in the soil and how much is in the groundwater. But as we pass on the modeling, that question will be answered. So uh, the following is the vegetation responses. So the left picture is the pond immediately formed um, uh, uh, after the e-watering. As you can see, there's literally no green color. Um, but once we visit the site two months later, you can see there is a green carpet on the water edges as the gray uh, vegetation start of renourishing. And this green carpet is um, the vegetation grow as mentioned before. And this is the picture takes, uh, taken at uh, November, October. So there are sneezing um, grasses uh, already cover the uh, whole basin. And then the green vegetation start to grow on top. So next slide, please. Um, besides uh, field monitoring, we also conducted laboratory experiment by bringing the, um, the, the soil sample back to the lab. We, uh, to do the wetting processes, 
we made an artificial pond on the surface, hoping it to uh, to infiltrate all the way down to the bottom, and that will be connected to by a container, uh, which is recorded by the electrical balance. We expecting the recharge is going to be taking to go all the way down in two weeks, as we observed in the field, but this is not true, because if you see these uh, waiting processes, over roughly uh, one hundred days the wetting front could only go about 20 centimeters below the bottom of the pond. So why there is a difference between the laboratory and the field? We believe that there are two reasons. Number one is that uh, in the field there are roots, there are cracks available within the alluvial soil, uh, which is not really available in our laboratory. Um, that's one of the reasons why um, it's different. The second possible difference is that the EC we used here, so in the field it's about 200 EC, whereas here we are using diagonalized water. But nevertheless, we use different types of waters. Um, none of them are able to um, infiltrate all the way down uh, to the outlet of the column. Now we do the reversing process, which is to remove the tank and then putting a heat lamp and fan on top and see the drying processes. So this video here shows the drying processes as shown in the picture. The cracks start off formating near the surface and the moisture sensor uh, shows all the drying uh, over the depth. Even after 72 days of the drying, um, which is taking place day and night, we can see there are still plenty of moisture staying within the soil uh, readily to support the vegetation. So the key message here is that um, the e-watering is not only being stored in the surface water pond, which is relatively easy to be depleted. Um, the underlying soil um, is also a second reservoir that occupies a significant amount of e-watering uh, to renourish the vegetation in long run. So as we discussed, um, we also use a numerical model to reproduce the hydrological process observed in the basin. So. Um, Given that the basin is in the ideal um, circular shape, uh, we decided to use a radio 2D uh, setup to implement um, the numerical model. So basically, the thickness is increasing as the distance uh, to the A uh, increases. So there are about four layers implemented. The surface is the pond with the porosity of one. A sealed layer has a relatively high porosity plus um, a high porosity and the sealed layer underneath, uh, as shown in the dark blue, has a very small porosity and this is based on the assumption that um, water is preferentially going through the cracks and the root zones rather than averagely going all the way down. And we know that if we make a relatively large porosity, um, the amount of e-watering is not able to uh, occupy all the pore spaces, let alone recharge as we observed. And the sandy aquifer has got a very sandy permeability plus the processes. So now let's look at the uh, result. So this is a big dashboard, but nevertheless it shows all the aspect about our numerical model. So first look at the uh, A, B, C and D. So these are the water level monitored at four boreholes at different locations. And the dots are the measurements and the lines are the simulations. So in general, our model replicate relatively well uh, the rise of the uh, water level as a result of e-watering and the dissipative of it uh, as the surface gets depleted. There is a bit inconsistencies and that's basically induced by the local vegetations and um, local heterogeneity, which we did not include in the model. The figure E here shows um, the surface water depth um, over time. We show different locations in our model and the green line um, agrees relatively well with um, the, um, the monitoring results, which shows that uh, the model is um, reasonably, well, um, reasonably well calibrated. So let's look at the uh, average um, as shown at the bottom right figure. So the total pumping is the boundary condition. The storage of the pond, uh, which is shown in the magenta, also follows the same um, um, trend. 
And now if we start of using our models, the model will be able to tell um, for the 65% of infiltration, how much is in the unsaturated zone and how much is recharge. And the answer to that is actually half, half, um, which means that we still have roughly 30% of the water within the unsaturated zone readily to support local vegetations. Uh, final thing is about the salinity distribution as shown in the salinity contour. So the yellow part is the saline water and the blue is the, um, the fresh water. So you can see that even the surface uh, pond gets depleted. There is a sort of fresh water length staying within the uh, water table and this fresh water lens is supposed to stay underneath the basin for a very, very long time until it's been well mixed with the salt water. So as conclusions, the recharge from top seal layer is significant despite the low permeability. The recharge is likely induced by the preferential pathways and the vegetation is found to be renourished evidently at the surface and the previous concern that recharge may enhance groundwater discharge is negligible. Finally, besides the water uh, surface water pond, the underlying soil also acts as an environmental water reservoir for vegetation near nourishment in long time scales. And this is the end of my presentation. Um, here I just show the process how we set up the monitoring station because we don't know how um, the soil will get softened. We use the large bricks to support the monitoring stations and now it's still standing on top of the uh, basin and delivering data as we speak. Thank you very much.